Folks, I'm going to once again have you be seated for the gospel reading. This is the second longest reading of the liturgical year. It is 40 verses. <clears throat> so luckily I cut the sermon in half to make up for this. I did not do that. That is a total lie. You're getting your standard length sermon and an extra long reading. So you must have been bad this week and need holiness. All right. <clears throat> As Jesus walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. <clears throat> When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Then he went and washed and came back able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, No, but it is someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus, made mud, spread it in my eyes, and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? And he said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who was formerly been blind, now it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. He said to them, he put mud on my eyes. Then I washed and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. He said, he is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but we do not know how it is that now he sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age. Ask him. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. And they said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have already told you, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him, saying, you are his disciple." But we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses. But as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from. And yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. But he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born entirely in sins, and are you trying to teach us? And they drove him out. Jesus heard that he had been driven out. And when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir? Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, you have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe. 
and he worshiped him. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment, so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? And Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would not have sin. But now that you say, we see, your sin remains. The Gospel of the Lord. A grace and peace to you from God our Creator and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. It is kind of amazing how two people can look at the exact same thing and see something totally different. And this happens all the time with my husband, Kevin, and I. Just shocker. <laughs> the other day, Grandma Beth came over to watch our little boy, Julian, who's four. And when Kevin and I got home, we both asked, well, you know, how is Julian? And Grandma says, oh, he was a good boy. Um, he did climb up on the bookshelf. And so I asked Grandma, did you put him in timeout? At the exact same time, Kevin asked Grandma, how high did he get? <laughs> same situation, two different ways of seeing. I saw danger that needed to be checked. Kevin saw a future rock climber who needed to be encouraged. And that is what is happening in our readings today, both of them. First, you get that Old Testament reading from Susan that she gave that Samuel looks at David and sees a scrawny kid. David looks, or God looks at David rather, and sees a king. And same thing happens with Jesus, only this time it is not Jesus versus one other person, it is Jesus versus an entire community of people. They both look at, at one person and see two different things. This man has been blind from birth, and Jesus looks at him and sees an opportunity for God's healing work to be active in the world. And these four different groups of people surrounding him in this community, all they see is a blind man. Some variation of that, but nothing like what Jesus sees. The disciples, you got well, those four groups are the disciples, the man's neighbors, the Pharisees, and his parents. And none of them see what Jesus sees. The disciples, they see a sinner. And the neighbors don't even see him anymore. They think it's someone else who maybe looks like him. All the Pharisees see are rules being broken. And all his parents see is trouble. They've been through enough already. Leave us out of it. He's of age. Talk to him. It's a problem. It is a problem. This guy might be physically blind, but everyone surrounding him is spiritually, emotionally, or morally blind. And everybody's got their excuses. But the truth is, it's a systemic problem. The whole system is functioning on a default setting that none of them are willing or maybe even very capable of breaking out of. And lest we think this is something easy that we could break out of, we have only to look at the power of default settings in our own lives. And now everybody kind of knows what a default setting is, right? It's essentially how something or someone operates without having to think about it. Either you were programmed that way from the start, or you have done something long enough that it has become your default setting. It's like your drive home from work, right? Don't even have to think about it anymore. That is default setting. Now, the human mind, the fact that the human mind naturally creates default settings isn't, again, necessarily a bad thing. The fact that I don't have to think about my drive home from work means that I can use my mind to plan supper, right? But default settings can be dangerous because they are easily manipulated. Now this is something that I guarantee happens to all of us every day, whether we're aware of it or not. Tech companies manipulate our readiness to accept default settings every single day. The apps on our phones, our computers, all have default settings that steer people toward behavior that benefits 
these companies. So when you download an app, like Facebook or Google, it automatically sets your preferences to share all kinds of things, like your location and your searches and your buying habits. You actually have to go into the app and reset your preferences to change that. But these companies rely on us being too lazy to do it. And it works. Here is the crazy number. 95% of people don't adjust their default settings. And now I know that there are many of you out there thinking to yourself, I need to do that. Maybe I'll do it now. <laughs> Let's save it for the offering. All right? <laughs> Companies make billions, billions manipulating behavior. Wired Magazine calls the, the practice dark patterning, which the name alone tells you something about it, right? Dark patterning. And look, if this were something that applied only to technology, maybe we could write it off. But this is, this is who we are. This is part of our fundamental humanity and part of what makes us a little bit broken. And the devil can take advantage of our default settings just as easily as tech companies can. And that is what is happening with the disciples, the neighbors, the Pharisees, and the man's parents. All of these groups have been doing things the same way and experiencing life in the same way for so long that they are stuck in these default settings, so much that they have given up hope that God can do a new thing. The disciples, they've been taught their whole lives that people who sin have bad things happen to them. So they're just wondering who in this situation did the bad thing. The neighbors, well, they've lived their whole lives seeing people stuck in situations that never change. They've seen this man beg his whole life. Why in God's name would it change? It never does. The Pharisees, they've lived their whole lives relying on power to keep them in rule, so they have a vested interest in making sure that this guy stays blind. And the parents, well, they have my heart because they have been under the stress of caregiving for so long that they are too tired to hope anymore. And everyone in this system is too tired, too hurt, to a morally bankrupt or too afraid to see what is happening with this blind man and Jesus, and they are missing out on all kinds of things, but mostly they're just missing out on joy. That God can do a good thing, a new thing, and that it could apply to someone we love. And I get that. For me, my default setting tends toward overwhelming cynicism. I get a little like the neighbors and the parents. I see people from my vantage point stuck in bad situations that never seem to change. And I see folks bearing the weight of caregiving. And instead of praying and trusting and doing what I can, I get stuck in the apathy and blindness of cynicism. And I find myself asking where God is and is God even capable of doing anything about this broke system that we're living in? And into that confusion and blindness, Jesus speaks. And he says today, hey, while you are worried about this whole big broken system, I am going to get to work on this one standing in front of me. I am going to get my hands dirty and change the sight of one person. He shows up in one man's life and says, I am not going to fix everything around you. My Father in Heaven has plans for this mess. What I'm going to do is reset your life, your vision, your future, your reality. And if you're like me and you want the whole big system to get fixed because it's frustrating, maybe that doesn't sound like the best news. That is, of course, until you realize that this blind man doesn't have a name. 
He is never named. And that is because Jesus is, in fact, talking about you. So let's talk about you, too. Let's talk about the limitations of your sight. If Jesus were to show up at your door today, what blindness would he rub mud on? What dead thing would he bury and raise up so that you could see clearly what he is trying to do in your life or trying to do in the life of a loved one that you've given up hope on or trying to do something in the life of someone you're just so crazy worried about? What is Jesus doing for you? Well, you know, I always have a story but I don't have one this week. I, I just have a little experience, really, which is a personal little tiny experience, and I hope it makes sense to you, and I hope um, it's not selfish of me to share it. Um, I'll go back to how I normally do sermons next week. So these last few months have been hard. They have been hard. There's been a lot of sickness, an unexpected loss in this community. And it has pushed me to a place of cynicism that I was talking about earlier. And when I was writing this sermon, I thought, you know what, I am just going to tell these people I'm struggling and I, I don't know what to do with it. I don't know how Jesus is calling me in particular out of the blindness I am experiencing right now. And I am as I normally do, I write a sermon out longhand first, and so I am just writing this whole tirade down when I get a text from a woman I have been praying for for the last month because she is sick. And doctors have been saying things like rare and experimental treatment, and we've never seen this. And it's been scary. But this text said, Scans came back with the best possible news today. There's hope and there's a plan. And I don't know. 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 I don't know where God is in that. I don't know why God does one thing here and doesn't do another thing there. I don't know what God is doing. I just know that her text was mud rubbed in my eyes and Jesus saying, go wash it off in the pool of baptism and see. See what I'm doing to this one standing in front of me and see what I am doing at work in the world still. And oh, by the way, I need you to keep getting your hands dirty. Because there are people standing in front of you with their one life, needing you to see. I don't know where you are at in this defaulted system. Whether you are a confused disciple, a doubt-filled neighbor, a sinful Pharisee, or an exhausted parent. But Jesus has a fistful of mud and he is ready to rub it in the eyes of anyone willing to stand in front of him and ask for the light of hope and truth and mercy. So we're just going to pray for it. We're going to pray for it this week and next week and the week after. We are going to pray for the sight to see what Jesus wants of you and your one life. Thanks be to God for this miracle working Savior. Amen.